We've learned so much more about in recent years. When I think back to my own school experience, we cheerfully went, ran out into frozen fields and took risks and climbed ladders and uh, generally uh, enjoyed our extracurricular activities without uh, a real safety framework. And I know students today enjoy a little bit more protection because of the work and the research and the 
professional learning that goes on at conferences like this. I do want to share a personal story about a close family member of mine who unfortunately suffered a serious concussion a few years ago. I'll never forget how scary it was to get that call and visit him in the hospital and to support him and his family over the early weeks of his recovery. At this point, many years later, he is uh, in his mind fully recovered, but unfortunately he has never recovered his sense of smell or taste. I think we can all appreciate what a deficit that is in terms of the quality of daily living. However, he is very positive and he's grateful for the care he received and uh, the functional improvement that he achieved as a result of the supports. What we know is that Health Sciences is working on effective treatments for concussion and head injuries. But what uh, we have to work with right now is a focus on risk avoidance and mitigation. So I really appreciate the fact that so many uh, leaders in our school system have gathered to learn from each other and learn from experts. And I know that you'll return to your schools and your classrooms and your networks, and you will protect our students and, their act and by making their activities safer. Thank you so much and have a great conference. Good morning. Welcome to day two of the International Concussion Summit hosted by the District School Board of Niagara. We begin this gathering by acknowledging the land on which we gather is the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe peoples, many of whom continue to live and work here today. This territory is covered by the Upper Canada Treaties and is within the land protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. Today, this gathering place is home to many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples, and acknowledging reminds us that our great standard of living is directly related to the resources and friendship of Indigenous people. This summit is made possible thanks to the vision of the DSBN Director of Education, Warren Hajizaki, Blaine Hajizaki, and the hard work of our ICS team with special mention to Colleen Fast, Roy Smith, Jennifer McGugan, and Lori Koje. This summit is streamlined for those who cannot attend, and the link can be found on the ICS page. We look forward to a great day two. As many of you know, uh, June is an extremely busy time in education, so we allowed schools this year uh, to share registrations across these two days, as some may not be able to make the arrangements to attend with us the entire time. We welcome any new attendees today following a remarkable day one. And as a quick review for some of us and a summary for our new delegates today, yesterday was like this. Ranging from a detailed summary of Dr. Cantu's research in chronic traumatic encephalopathy to Dr. Stam's presentation that focused on issues of repeated head impacts, especially as they pertain to youth in sports, and Dr. Letty's engaging conversation and talk on how to speak Canadian and the challenges of border travel when coming all the way from Buffalo. Oh, sorry, that was my rough notes. I mean, Dr. Letty's presentation 
on the physiology of concussion and mechanisms of recovery, we all engaged in some of the most current, meaningful, and hopeful learning in brain injury research anywhere in the world. And of course, who can forget Dr. Blaine Hajizaki's interaction with Grant Fuhr in the opening Q&A? After asking him the hard-hitting question of, what is the hardest shot to stop in hockey? Blaine not really appreciating the initial reply that the shot actually needs to be hard and strong, proceeds to engage our Hall of Fame speaker in a role play simulation by saying to him, if I was coming down in, on you in a hockey game, should I shoot low blocky? Imagine what Grant Fuhr, five cups, seven time all-star, must have been thinking at that moment. <laughs> Blaine, I'm gonna ask you a question what your brother often asked me in my daily work. What is wrong with you? With the quality of presentations lined up for today, the learning opportunities will continue to be world-class and inspiring, truly meeting the unparalleled standards of the ICS and reinforcing the high quality of researchers and people our event tracks every year. Along with this great learning for us in this venue today, we have broadened the reach of the summit this year as Jennifer Botterill is meeting with students from our Niagara Falls High Schools this morning. She is at West Lane Secondary School right now, sharing her experiences with a message about mental health, leadership, and resiliency. She will be joining us for the closing keynote at 11 o'clock. We are so thankful that you made the commitment to be here in person and to make this event a reality. There is a lot that goes on to make this happen. I acknowledge that. But without your drive to learn more and better support those that you serve, and make the commitment of time and funds and energy to actually be here face to face, the eighth ICS would not have come together. So please accept our thanks. Let's get started today. Our first keynote speaker for today is Dr. Janie Cornway. Dr. Cornway is an athletic therapist with over 15 years of experience working primarily with youth in high school tackle football. She completed her doctoral and postdoctoral research at the University of Ottawa in Neurotrauma Impact Science Laboratory, studying the association between head impact severity and signs and symptoms of sports-related concussion. She has led projects designed to better inform helmet manufacturers and helmet testing standards, and is now studying the relationship between concussions and muscules musculoskeletal injuries, as well as injury prevention in sports. Dr. Cornway is also the scientific director, clinician, and co-owner at the Concussion Institute, where her and her interdisciplinary team provide evidence-based concussion management and rehabilitation to patients with mild traumatic brain injuries. What stood out in Dr. Cornway's uh, bio, probably to many of us in this room, is her passion for teaching. Dr. Cornway is a lecturer for the School of Human Kinetics at the University of Ottawa. But along with teaching, she also has a passion for hockey. This isn't in her bio, I learned this last night. Though she never played, she's a, a good skater. She's registered for a hockey camp this summer at Concordia that's put on by a few members of current and former Canadian Olympic women's hockey team for beginning adults to play hockey. Very impressive. But what was more impressive was the picture of her as a two-year-old sitting in the Stanley Cup that she has on her phone. So she might show you that later today if you connect with her. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Cornway. We're honored to have you. Welcome. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Mike, for this nice um, pre presentation or introduction. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the uh, DSBN for having me here. Uh, thank you to Mike and his team to making me feel so welcome and special throughout this conference. Um, I think that Mike said pretty much everything there is to say <laughs> about me from my introduction. Um, the one thing I need to stress is that yes, I did my PhD with Dr. Blaine Aoshizaki. Uh, I graduated two years ago. Unfortunately, I still have some level of PTSD, so I'm not ready to joke about it yet. <laughs> Warren knows what I'm talking about. 
And my main interest is just to provide more safety for our athletes to keep playing, and I do that by educating, having patients, and providing on-field medical care at sporting and athletic events. Events. Today's main objective is to discuss how to best implement concussion policies and procedures to make sure that we have the best outcome possible. And I know that from the requirement from Rowan's Law, each and every one of you have to review concussion awareness tools, concussion uh, assessment tools. Today, we will not be reviewing that in depth. We will be testing your knowledge a little bit and then discussing how to best implement those policies, things, little things that we can add to our policies and procedures that make a big difference in identifying concussion and managing them. So we're gonna go with what we call a medicine and clinical practice with evidence-based medicine that includes the best research possible, but also takes into consideration the clinician expertise and the patient values and preference. If we want to apply that to concussion management, we use the most recent recommendation, the, again, the clinician experience, and then we factor in feedback from the administrators, the educators, the coaches, the parents on how they like to receive that information and what makes sense to them so that they feel that their child is safe, that the kids their coachings are safe, or the student athlete themselves feel at ease to play the sport. I like to go a little backward. I will start with a take home message. So what I want you to take from this presentation today is understand the value of having a qualified healthcare provider, professional, practitioner, call it whatever you want. I will be calling it HCP for the rest of the presentation. But having a qualified HCP as part of the concussion protocol to help design the policies and procedure, but also implement them. We are also gonna discuss how every stakeholder contribute to that process. So when I talk about stakeholders, I talk about the school administrators, the educators, the teachers, the school nurse, the ATs, PTs, uh, GPs, all of the practitioner, as well as the student athletes and their parents. And how we can implement a culture and an environment where student athletes' safety is the most important point. I would also like you to remember that concussion management requires time and a lot of communication. So where do these concussion policies and procedure come from? Well, we start with all the legislation and the latest recommendation from multidisciplinary expert in Canada, Ontario is the only province that has a law that helps implement concussion management. In the United States, all 50 states and the District of Columbia have some kind of legislation for concussion management. And the main objective of these legislation is to prevent catastrophic head and brain injury. And all of them have any uh, have at least two things in common. It involves early recognition and removal from the activity and establishing criteria for return to participation. I'm only gonna browse on this because I know that all of you know that, but the key points for Rowan's Law is that it was developed as a result of a catastrophic event when a young athlete from Ottawa died as a result of multiple impact in a very short period of time. The condition that Rowan developed is called second impact syndrome. It's a condition in which the brain starts swelling in an uncontrolled matter, and because there's nowhere to go, it gets compressed by the skull. And as you can think, it doesn't have a good outcome. It's deadly in most cases. Um, it doesn't happen often, but it's the worst case scenario. So every precaution we take, every safety guards we have in place is to prevent this from happening. 
The other requirements that are common for any of the stakeholders is yearly review of the concussion resources, so staying up to date is very important. As you saw in the last, last yesterday, there's a lot of research going on. It's coming out fast, so being up to date is important. We need to have established concussion protocols so that we know what to do, how to ha act when we can identify a concussion, and that goes from early identification and removal. It's the most important point, but it's also the most challenging point. And then the guidelines for return to play, which in Ontario requires clearance from a physician, so a GP or a nurse practitioner. This is a short summary of the uh, international con consensus statement on sport concussion. They have like a four step that describe what the protocol should be, or the element of the protocol, which is recognize and remove, assess and reevaluate, refer, and a progressive return to play. And again, I highlighted that it requires medical clearance before going back to play. So now it's the time of the day where you get a quiz. I know it's early, but I need you to bear with me here. So here we have three athletes. We have Sarah, who got elbowed on the nose during a soccer game. She has a bloody nose that doesn't seem to have any displacement. She has teary eyes. She has blurry vision, but Sarah says it's just because she has too much tears in her eye. And she's angrier, angrier than you have ever seen her. We also have Dave, who got into a helmet-to-helmet -helmet contact. He stayed down without moving for about 30 to 45 seconds. Then he jumped straight back up, jogged to the sideline, and when you talk to him, he says he's fine, he's not, he's not reporting any symptoms. And then we have Steven, who complained of nausea and fatigue before the game, had a small collision at the end of the second quarter, and during halftime, he vomited in the trash can. And that's the moment he chose to tell you that his entire family was recovering from gastroenteritis. So based on the very little information I gave you, which one of these athletes, there might be more than one, that would require to be assessed for a concussion? Who says A? Who says B? Who says C? Dr. Letty's got it. All three of them would require a concussion <laughs> assessment because they all had an event and they all, all have at least one sign and symptom of a concussion. Now I'm gonna ask you the question slightly differently. Would you feel comfortable with any of these athletes not having a concussion assessment because it, there's a high likelihood that it's something else? Hopefully the answer is no, because like I said, they all add a head acceleration event, so a head impact or a body uh, impact that led to whiplash, and they add one side or symptoms of concussion, and this all we need to remove an athlete from play and refer them to a healthcare professional for a full assessment. So here I pointed the symptoms of athlete a, B, and C, and in the case of Dave, the only thing that was observable was that he lied motionless on the playing surface. I'd like to make sure that everyone understand that it's absolutely not necessary to confirm the concussion to remove the athlete and to refer. As soon as it's suspected, you remove the athlete because there are no tests that allows anybody to eliminate the suspicion of a concussion. If you remember one thing from my talk, remember this. If in doubt, sit them out. Now we're gonna keep testing your knowledge. We need to know the red flags. Who needs to go to the hospital? So in scenario A, Sarah, keeps complaining of a headache and it's getting slowly, progressively worse in intensity. Dave got numbness 
tingling in his pinky finger and one of his hand doesn't squeeze as hard as the other one when you ask, ask him to. And Steven vomits again after the game. Who sends A to the hospital? Who sends B to the hospital? Who sends C to the hospital? The answer is again, all three of them. So if you ever meet any of my students, whenever the question on a multiple choice is all of the above, it's always the answer to select. <laughs> So, Sarah had severe and increasing headache and she had facial trauma, which is not part of these red flags, but should be. Dave had weakness and tingling in his arms and leg, and Stephen vomited more than once. I don't know if there are parents of young kids here or any Disney fan, but you guys would know that we shouldn't talk about Bruno, but we're gonna talk about Bruno this morning. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you should watch Encanto, it's a wonderful movie. So in this case, we're, don't, we're not dealing about Bruno from the Marigold family, but we're talking about an up and coming tennis player. He's being recruited by D1 schools in the USA. His parents and his coach are always speaking of his potential and how great he's gonna be. But, you know, Bruno's not all about tennis. He also has other interests. He loves science. He loves spending time with his friends, watching Marvel movies. And his biggest hope is to get a full-ride scholarship in an engineering program that will allow you to play tennis at the same time. Ten days ago, Bruno fell down the stairs at the tennis facility. He's had a headache and light sensitivity since then. He has not told anyone because he has a big match coming up in front of American coaches, but he's had trouble studying because of his headache. He failed a math test, and he even refused to go to the premiere of the latest Doctor Strange movie, which if any of you are familiar with those movies, you don't go see if you have a concussion. It's way too many moving parts on the screen. Concussion policies are not there only to prevent catastrophic head and brain injuries. They're also there to make sure that our athletes can flourish in all spheres of their life, making sure that they can uh, reach goals that are outside of sports, so academia, having a well-rounded social life. So that's also why we have concussion policies and procedures. We know that at least 50% of concussion go unreported despite our best effort, despite putting all of this in place, despite having education. Yes, there is a big lack of objectivity and specificity of the symptoms that make the diagnosis or the identification complex. However, that means that we rely on athletes' willingness to disclose the injury. And we know from science that there's some barriers to this. And by knowing that, then we can account for that and implement better policies and procedures that can improve the disclosing of the injury. So we know that athletes have a desire to re remain in the game. And that's very difficult to change because athletes are competitive and sports is part of their identity. I don't have the answer for you there because as a very competitive person, starting hockey at 37 years old, um, I, I can't help you. <laughs> However, I know that other factors such as the interpersonal dynamic between the athletes, their teammates, and the coaches can be changed. It requires culture change. Um, we also know that an emphasis that is solely on winning games increases the risk of athlete hiding their injury. And we know that the parents have an influence to play on that. So parents that have a financial interest or an agenda for their kids' professional life are more likely to have kids that are not willing to disclose their injury. Fortunately, we also have things that help. So having a healthcare professional helps improving disclosing rate. It even helps even more 
if the healthcare professional that's there is consistent so that they can build a relationship based on trust and respect so that the athlete feels supported when they disclose their injury. One other thing is the student athlete's comfort level with their superiors and their teams. Dr. Cantu yesterday was talking about having a coach that support disclosing injury is important in the process and I truly believe it, it starts with the coaches. Another challenge is the mitigating circumstances. So we talked, the three case study I gave you were case studies that are very complicated, complex, hard to recognize, and that was by design. We have some athletes that don't experience any symptoms after the head impact until after the game is over or even the next day, or even when they go back to school and they have to use their brain a little more. We have athletes that display symptoms of very low intensity or they're very short-lived. So they will feel like they have their bell rung for 30, 45 seconds, and that's their only symptoms. They should be removed. Try telling that to somebody that feels like they're 100% a minute later. That's a big challenge. Weather condition, so we talked about symptoms that are not specific. Try exercising in 40 degrees Celsius, 80% humidity, and tell me if you have nausea, dizziness, fatigue. Try doing that in a contact sport, like football, where there's plenty of head impacts. How do you differentiate heat-related illnesses from concussion? The answer is you can't. So you need to remove put them in the return to learn, return to school protocol. And in the worst case scenario, they don't have a concussion, so they move through those steps really fast, really easily. So in the best case scenario, you identified a potential concussion and you took all the precaution needed for that athlete. Other con conditions have similar symptoms, so that makes the identification more complex like Stephen, who had a family with gastroenteritis and he was vomiting. That makes it hard to say. So if you're not confident in enacting that protocol, Stephen might not have been identified as somebody who might have had a concussion. And he may have been allowed to keep playing. And he might have hit his head again. That's important to <laughs> err on the side of caution and not be scared to make a mistake. It's better to over-suspect than to miss one. I'm not gonna lie to you, as an athletic therapist, there is no other condition that causes more conflicts than concussion. I am constantly arguing with coaches, athletes, and their parents, all the time. That's a barrier. If you I have a healthcare professional that's there that doesn't like conflict, they might not identify a lot of concussions. So you need to have somebody there that doesn't seek conflict, but is comfortable having those hard discussions. Again, I am repeating this. The wording on parachute in the international consensus and on Rowan's law says if you suspect a concussion, you remove. No need for confirmation. And the one thing I would like to add is what makes people more comfortable at identifying and taking those steps in cases that are more challenging is expertise, so a lot of knowledge, but also experience. So you wanna have somebody that's dealt with a few cases so that they feel comfortable not having that doubt that they need to be sure of the diagnosis. So now that we've identified our barriers and our facilitators, how do we improve that? Well, it's a top-down approach, so it has to start with the administrators. You need to remind everyone, all the stakeholders, that the mission of a youth sport organization, whether it's from within the school or not, is to promote the development of well-rounded individuals through sports. 
We have to have an emphasis on student athletes' well-being from all the stakeholders, which means the coaching staff that's hired needs to embody and promote this culture. The athletes and the parents need to be educated about that culture, about all the other benefit of being part of a sport team other than winning and performing. And we need to promote overall personal growth instead of performance only. That means academic performance, social cultural competency, physical mental health, coping skills, work ethics, all of these other elements should be at the front of center of sports participation. The other part is providing adequate medical care. I've already said it. You need a healthcare professional with expertise and experience and a personality suited to manage conflict. It also helps, although it's not necessary, to have an HCP that knows the sport they cover and they actually enjoy it. Grand Fury was talking yesterday about having coffee with the trainers every morning. I was laughing because I truly enjoy and cherish those moments when I get to just interact with my athletes about anything else but pain and injury. <laughs> and honestly, I do the same thing with coaches too, because I can't be the girl that always has bad news. So I go and talk to them about game plan, about upcoming games, about what they're talking about, like what strategies they're going to use so that they feel like I have other interests but to say, sorry, your store quarterback is not playing this weekend because <laughs> that doesn't go well very often. Having a consi consistent HTP so that they can build those relationships also helps a lot. Sometimes the only thing that tells me an athlete might have a concussion is I notice that they're just not like usual. But I need to know what their usual is in order to do that. So I need to spend time with them, get to connect with them, so that I can know when they look slightly off. And I can go and then ask my question and do an assessment. Another part I can talk about is baseline testing. Baseline Testing is not recommended by the international consensus, is not recommended by Parachute Canada, and it's frankly not necessary for the identification of a concussion or even knowing when to return to play. However, I find so much value in some form of assessment at the beginning of the season, not for concussion management, but it gets me to connect with my student athletes, give me an opportunity to educate them about concussion, uh, go through the symptom checklist, which is a reminder of what the symptoms of a concussion are, and I also look at the symptoms and see if there are any red flags for any other condition. The, red, the checklist includes symptoms such as trouble sleeping, Anxiety, depression, trouble concentrating, trouble memor uh, with memory. So I get to talk to the athletes and see, are there any athletes that are at risk of developing a mental health illness throughout the, the year? And if so, then I provide them with some resources for managing stress and anxiety, discuss that I can be the first point of contact if they ever feel the need that they need more help and I even discuss my own experience with anxiety so that they feel that if they ever need help, they have somebody to reach out that is there for them. And that might not be relevant to concussion, but it's really relevant to student athletes' well-being. It's also a great time to meet with everyone, the parents, the coaches, discuss how we're gonna manage concussion so that everyone knows, so that there's no surprise. Again, most conflict from any condition in sport, concussion. So if I can tell the parents what's gonna happen, tell the coaches what's gonna happen, they're not surprised when I tell them, so they're not aggressive in their behavior. 
And well, again, that's a great time for me to spend some time with the athletes and just establish that relationship. Now we're gonna talk about Kandra, just so you know where I'm going after with this. Kandra's a 16-year-old former basketball player. She sustained a concussion two years ago, and she's still experiencing symptoms. So I started seeing uh, Kandra. I changed all the names, by the way. <laughs> Those are all real people. I changed the names. Uh, so Kandra, I started seeing her two years after a concussion. She's still experiencing symptoms, and obviously her symptoms interfere with all aspects of her life, her academic performance, her social life, her mental health. At her third meeting, Kendra told me she thought she had depression. She felt hopelessness. She did not feel joy anymore. She had no interest in anything. And while I was discussing this aspect with her, she admitted that she even had suicidal thoughts. This conversation was only possible because the concussion assessment was done in a private area, so not at school, not with the peers, not with the other student athletes. It was done in a private setting, and I was able to establish a good relationship from the start. So we're gonna talk about why this is important to have concussion care in a private setting that is not related to the school, not related to the team, so that athletes can open up. However, concussion recovery starts on the field. It's very complex. It requires a multidisciplinary approach. Dr. Cantu, Dr. Letty both said it, multidisciplinary. You need multiple professionals to be able to manage a concussion. And it takes the collaboration of everybody that's involved in the care of students. It's often complicated by biopsychosocial factor that can either improve the recovery or impede the recovery. But they need to be addressed early in order to prevent persistence of symptoms. We need to be able to identify individuals that are at risk of having a negative outcome. When the athlete leaves the field, the athlete and their parent should know what the next steps are. They shouldn't have to find out two days later how they're communicating with school, how they're letting them know they're not gonna come to school, who they should see, it should all, they should all have that information before they leave the playing field. And this is just an example, this is a sheet that we give to our athletes, and I know that Ophia yesterday I went to, um, she's there, I went, <laughs> went to their talk, their breakout session, and they have a lot of resources on uh, forms to fill out that we can give to parents. So this is just an example. Uh, but here we have like all the uh, information relative to the injury and we have a symptom uh, management, well, just a symptom evolution uh, table so that we can know how the symptoms are evolving. And on the second page, we have the red flags that the parents should keep monitoring for up to 40, uh, 24 to 48 hours after the activity, and we also tell them what they should do and what they shouldn't do. So you can see on there, there's avoid alcohol, so that might not be an issue at all levels, but as student athletes go up, while well, they wanna go party with their friends after the game, so unfortunately they should not, so <laughs> we have to actually state it in writing. Um, and another item is that they need to see a healthcare professional that has expertise and experience in concussion management. At this point, you want to refer. You need to remember that at some point they're gonna require clearance from a nurse practitioner or physician. So I heard the talk at OFIA yesterday and it's not always easily accessible to have an appointment with this professional. So as soon as you have the concussion, you can set up that appointment, but that doesn't mean you need to wait to see a GP or nurse practitioner before you go see a lead L care professional, such as a physiotherapist or an athletic therapist. This should be undertaken as soon as possible. Taking care of symptoms early can limit the risk of persistence. If you're looking to see who can provide 
Good Concussion Care, Parachute Canada has come up with a list to identify clinics that are appropriate for concussion care, and I think that's very important that you look at it. There are a lot of clinics that are a bit predatory in their practice, uh, so it's really important to identify this so that you have somebody that can truly help uh, the student athletes with the concussion. So the first point is to have a physician or a nurse practitioner in-house, um, or at least that at the first meeting, they should recommend that you make that appointment. So they should recognize the value of these healthcare professionals, because not all private clinic have these professional on site, but they should at least tell you that it's gonna be needed. They should have a multidisciplinary and multifactorial approach. So they have a team of different healthcare professional, ATs, physios, osteopath, massage therapists, oculomotor specialists, so that they can take care of all the different symptoms of concussion. And then they have to assess all of these different elements and see what's the first priority in terms of managing concussion. They need to use evidence-informed practice and be up-to-date on the latest recommendation. So in my experience, it takes a lot of time to do this. Our assessment is 90 minutes. So again, as much as I want to refer to a GP and a nurse practitioner, which is very important, I know that they don't have the time to do that much of an in-depth assessment. They don't have 90 minutes per patient. So I go through evolution of symptoms, physical exam, and then I looked at other factors such as sleep, nutrition, mood, anxiety, depression, tendencies, or even if they have already some strategies in place to manage this. Uh, I looked at their school, work, sport requirements, so that I can provide recommendation on progressive return to activities and prioritize which activities are most important to them, because there's the mental aspect of thing as well. You cannot just make it seem this is what you need to do, is what do you like to do? Because having some activities that they enjoy as part of the recovery is important. And that's often for, forget, uh, forgotten in a concussion protocol. Also take time to educate about each of the, the different elements and to make recommendation. And then the other time is spent communicating with everybody else to see what the student athlete should do. One of the ways that you can improve that process is to develop a partnership with a local organization that provides healthcare. First of all, it helps with the communication because you can make them aware of your communication policies, which forms they, you would like to see, which information you would like to receive so that you can help them manage the concussion, uh, and also prevents athletes from falling between the cracks. And the other part is for, on your side to have written policies so that when athletes go to a clinic, they can bring your piece of paper that says, this is the information I need to see. However, even if you establish a partnership with a local clinic, for example, you cannot force your athletes to go there. Seeking care outside of the partnership is 100% okay, as long as they all the, the, everybody has the information of what information you require to best help the healthcare professional manage the concussion. One of the most important yet underestimated factor in concussion recovery is the trust in the HCP. And the example of that is Kendra. Kendra trusted me, so I was able to put in place all the you know, suicide prevention plan for her so that she can get the mental health she, need, she needed. The other element is, again, communication. You don't, like, I don't know if you understand how much communication goes between the HCP and the school. What can they do? What can they not do? What should the accommodation be? Or do they have any thing that should be more uh, put into emphasis, like a subject that they struggle maybe a little bit more, or as a 
ministry exam component to it. So having that communication is very important. We're almost to the end, so now I'm gonna wrap up everything and make it a three-step plan to optimize on-field concussion management, putting together everything we just discussed. Preparation, organization-specific concussion policies and procedure. What is organization-specific? Is that means that the roles and responsibility of the various stakeholders are very well defined. And I don't mean HCP will do this. Put the names and the contact information of the people that are doing this so that people know that it's their responsibility. So take the protocol that is provided by the Ontario government and OFIA and then put your information into it. Another part that's important is how is the culture of the athlete's safety and well-being in developing a well-rounded individual is going to be promoted? How is, the, how is this going to be implemented? And are you, how are you going to be evaluate if you're making a difference on that aspect? I think that should be a key point in there. And then all the other stuff that are always part of a concussion protocol, so the recognition and removal, the aftercare, so how do you refer, how do you communicate, what the return to play, return to school protocols are, the contact person, and a contingency, contingency plan for conflict management. So if there are any conflicts, who's going to manage that? And there was one point that should be written there, and I might be very biased, but it should state that the administrator will back the HCP 100%. It should be written in there. When we talk about communication, we want to communicate the protocol to all the stakeholders. Obviously, you can't use the same resources for everybody because the roles and responsibility are slightly different. However, everybody should be aware of what the roles and responsibility of everyone is. One of the things that often happen is there's some mixed messaging. When somebody has a concussion, everybody has an opinion. Student, other student athletes that had a concussion will go and tell them they should do this. Their parents will say, oh, my sister had one and we did this. The teacher might say something. The coach will say something else. It has to be uniform. Concussion patients are already confused enough as it is. Can we make sure they get all the important information in one place in a uniform? And it needs to be interactive and engaging. It can't just be a video or reading this. You need to have case studies. You need to test to see if people actually understand the material that they would send all three of my athletes to the hospital because they needed to. Also, what communication needs to be done after a concussion, who's notified, and basically writing down a chain of command of who need to be notified and who's notifying who. My experience, again, the HCP is at the center of this. It facilitates communication between everyone. They can email the administrator and the educator, let them know what the recommendations are. It facilitated the appointments for aftercare, makes the communication with the coaches, parents, student athletes. And they also know when to refer to other healthcare professionals for, uh, for more care or a different care. Action, well, obviously, I'm going to that, right? Hire the qualified HCP and provide them with the appropriate resources to take care of your student athletes. Develop partnerships with local organizations for clinical care. Again, one thing to remember for all this, if in doubt, set them out and refer. Lastly, evaluate your concussion protocol every year. Talk with everyone, what went well, what didn't go well, what can we improve, revise it as needed, test the knowledge of everyone involved, and hold everyone accountable. Thank you. I will take, we have 20 minutes for questions. So I, 
did it in my 40 minutes. <laughs> All right, I guess I was very clear. No, don't, you can't go yet. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm gonna pop up at every mic at some point here. Um, in your references today, you talked a lot about the, G, the GP in it and in the whole process and how important that is. I sat in on a concussion conference that was run by Queen's University earlier in the year and Dr. Tatter was speaking and I can't remember the exact question that he, that he was asked, but, you know, his assessment of practice, sort of, you know, you go to your family doctor or general practitioner, that, you know, his assessment was they're sometimes five and ten years behind research. That perhaps us that are in this room are leaving today maybe more uh, aware of concussion protocol and recovery practices and those things. Um, and I've spoken to a few of, the, of our experts that are here over the last couple of days, and they concurred that, yeah, you go to your family doc and you're not sure. And you, you mentioned the GP a lot. I'm just wondering, like, how, how is the, your profession, the research that you do, how are you closing that gap between what you're telling us today and what Dr. Letty talked to us yesterday about recovery, and then, you know, one of us has a, has a child that gets a bump on the head and goes to the doctor. How do we know they know what the next steps are? We kind of have to, we do count on them to, to, be, to be current. So I know it's a big question, but I just wasn't sure if you had some insight. Thank you. It's a very good question, and it's a question that comes a lot. Um, it's a difficult question for me to answer because I'm not a GP, and um, in most provinces, the College of Medicine determines what the scope of practice of other professionals are. So I like agree that most GP might be a little behind, and that's why I said you don't need to wait for the GP to go see an elite healthcare professional that has concussion expertise and experience. And that's why that was there, because the GP is there because it's part of the law. And my professional answer has to be, well, it needs, you need to go. My experience answer would say, you make the appointment, you go see the other healthcare professional, and that healthcare professional can also write a comprehensive note, this is the assessment we did, this is what we found, this is how we're going to approach it, and we recommend that we do this, would you agree with that plan of treatment? And from that, they have the education to see, like, oh, my God, they're doing all this for concussions? <laughs> okay, maybe I should read into this. Or they're just next patient. Even better, they refer them to me <laughs> every time, and they will build relationship like this. But it, part of it comes from other HCP that actually educate the GP about what to do. But if you... And it, part of the responsibility, responsibility, unfortunately, falls on the patient. They go see their GP and they don't receive the suggestion, the recommendations that are up to date. And they don't know that it's wrong. So again, that comes to the work of a lot of education and these conferences and all the good they bring. Because now, if you, as a teacher, have an athlete that's not recovering from a concussion and the doctor is not doing any recommendation, you can say, oh, I went to that conference and they suggested maybe going to see a physiotherapist or an athletic therapist. Maybe try that. So now you're part of that solution. Hi. Hi. Um, so I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to get this question out, but um, my question is how would you deal with the situation? So I'm from New Brunswick. Uh, I help at a concussion clinic with a CASM certified orthopedic surgeon uh, who has a ton of concussion experience. Over the years, we've been doing this for 15 plus years now, and there have been numerous situations where, you know, we spend an hour, an hour and a half with the athlete, the parent, and based on our assessment, we feel, yep, they have signs and symptoms associated with the concussion. 
the parent that is living vicariously through their son or daughter's sporting career says, well, that's your opinion. They're in the championship game this weekend. It's their grade 12 year. They've earned the right to play, and we'll deal with this concussion next week after the sport. We're then on the sidelines at the game, and lo and behold, the athlete shows up with a note from the emergency department clearing them to play. So I'm just curious as to what, like, what are we supposed to do um, in a situation like that? Because it happens all the time. It's a very good question, and it happens to me all the time as well. The, so first of all, in the, co the concussion policies and procedure of the organization, it should be written and made aware to everyone that the person that's in charge of the health and safety of the athlete as a veto on any medical clearance. So you cannot allow people to go back to play if somebody else said no. Well, you're an orthopedic surgeon, you can do what you want, but I can't. <laughs> so in my PMP that I give to the parents, athlete, coaches, it's written that I can veto any clearance. However, if a doctor says no, I'm never gonna over overrule that. So it's written in the PMP. The most challenging part is when you, they're in a private setting and you make that recommendation that they shouldn't play and the parent says, no, we're playing anyway, you have no control in keeping that athlete out. So you need to do your best to provide the education to make sure that they make the appropriate decision and you have to write it in your note that the parent is disagreeing and will go to the game anyway. They, they, some leagues allow for, you know, reports uh, through a centralized system. I think this needs to be more common as well. Um, one of the situations I can give you is I used to work with a football team and the kid played football and hockey and I was keeping it out of football, but the parents were still bringing them to hockey. And I'm like, what are you doing? So I had to contact the parents and talk and talk and talk and it was like, well, we're paying for hockey, it's very expensive, so we don't want them to miss time off. And I'm like, well, you're gonna pay a lot more money if then you need to see a specialist for X period of time. So there's a lot of education that goes into that, but at the organization level, veto has to be there. Very good question. So I have a question. So we talk about um, sending our athletes to see these allied health professionals and going to these clinics, um, which aren't necessarily covered under OHIP. So going to our GP is covered. And if you do have coverage, you often need that referral note. Um, but are there any resources available for our athletes or our students that don't have that additional coverage? This is also <laughs> something that is a very real barrier to concussion care. Most of them are done in private clinic, not covered by OHIP or the Quebec REMQ, for those of you who are familiar with that. And those resources are not readily available. And one way to go about that, and one thing that we really promote is for a sports organization to hire HCP. <laughs> so that they're there on site with a, like a room in the school, a little clinic that they can see people and provide that care at the school. In my opinion, and I don't wanna force anybody on this, but in my opinion, if you can afford athletics, you need to be able to afford an HCP. And I was gonna say an athletic therapist, but I'm biased and I don't wanna <laughs> just keep it at that, but a uh, qualified HCP. So that would take care of some of that care. Um, or we have some organization that pay for the first appointment. So the sport team pay for the first appointment so we can do the assessment, make recommendation, and we can send them to something that's covered with that initial assessment and the recommendation and then somebody else takes care of it. Thank you for that recommendation. You're welcome. 
story. If I can just build on that, I, again, I'm from New Brunswick, and, and in New Brunswick, any student playing high school sports, if they get injured at the high school sport, uh, they do have coverage through the schooling um, sport in insurance program. I'm not sure what that's like in other provinces, but um, so to her question, if, they, if mom or dad's private plan doesn't have coverage for whoever they're seeing, uh, it can be built through the school's insurance policy. It's a bit of a paperwork trail, but it's a pretty good coverage program back home. Yeah, thank you for this because actually you made me realize that a lot of sports organizations have this as well. Hockey Canada has an insurance program. Uh, the soccer, football, Quebec, all of these have cover like medical coverage as part of like their in registration fee. It's not very extensive, but it can cover at least part of the management. Thank you for <laughs> reminding me. Good morning. Good mor just a minute. <laughs> <laughs> she has a question, Mike. <laughs> so I, I have a question on behalf of all the rural communities in Ontario, so I appreciate when I come to these things the services available in southern Ontario. When we are advocating with our local medical team in a tiny town that has one locum and no athletic therapist and no physiotherapist and an OT that's completely overwhelmed, who can we ask to be referred to? I, I know I left yesterday doing a referral to Sunnybrook, I think that's the right name, but who do we specifically say this is an organization we need to do referrals to for these kids? That's a very good question. I, I've got to be honest, I don't know because I'm not, I don't work in Ontario, I work in oh. Quebec. Um, however, uh, pandemic, vi like tele telehealth, so you can have a virtual appointment with some professionals that are located anywhere else in Ontario. Okay. So there are clinics that offer that and can at least make the initial initial assessment. So if they're in. Uh, make initial recommendation, and then if they suspect there's a physical component such as a neck or a kilomotor, then they can say, well, actually, you should really go and see somebody that can treat that, but at least you have that initial recommendation. Thank you, because I think that's what we're, I, I would be looking for, is just the names of specific concussion clinics, like Sunnybrook, if there are others that I can actually say to the hospital, these clinics take virtual appointments for our kids because I think that's where we're at in rural Ontario is just like we, we're driving the bus mm -hmm. um, for our kids. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. Hi. Uh, what, what kind of treatment, do, so an, an athlete with a concussion comes to a physiotherapy clinic, what kind of treatment do they receive at a physiotherapy clinic? And is oh. there any, are there any treatments that could be brought back to a school setting, like something that we could then have if it, as part of what we're doing at school? Well, the, the most important part is like activity management. So a lot of it goes with education on what they can do, what they cannot do, symptom management, so what they can do when their symptoms are rising up, um, sleep manage, like it, you can, well, your nervous system cannot function if you don't sleep. So everybody leaves with first recommendation, this is how you improve sleep, I want you to do that before nighttime so that at least you sleep well. Uh, some meditation and then a return to physical activity, uh, as Dr. Liddy uh, said. So that's the big portion of it. Depending on what we then observe, then if there's a neck dysfunction, then we're going to treat the neck. If there's a dysfunction in oculomotor function, then we're going to prescribe exercise for that, do that with that. If there's balance issue, then we'll prescribe balance exercises. So it's based on the symptoms, but the first part is to decrease the overall symptoms load so that we can see what's left, what's contributing to symptoms persisting, and then we treat that. Thank you. You're welcome. Sorry, bro, I got one more question. <laughs> so funny how I'm coming back from, uh, I'm a manipulative physiotherapist and an osteopath, okay. and I practice Chinese medicine, acupuncture, lots of different things. It's an excellent, um, you did a great job. I think it's been an excellent conference so far. The one thing I would like to see is the answer to that, because I treat a lot of concussions, is the hands-on. You need to have a, go see a practitioner, and it's whether it's a physio, whether it's a chiropractor, somebody who spends time with you and who is literally assessing you from head to toe, not just at the neck, 
Because if you understand science and the embryological evolution of a human body, you are one body. You need to treat the fascial system, you need to treat the muscular system, you need to be smart, you don't have to be. It starts off being very gentle. And in my opinion, you have to do that prior to the exercise part before you increase vascular flow. So I just, for me, I think I'd like to see the other grassroots therapists be involved a bit more because I'm seeing a ton of them. And then it's my communication barrier that I'm having with doctors and other healthcare professionals who don't have my level of skill. Sorry, I'm a bit of a geek. I spend my, <laughs> my, my waking time dissecting bodies all the time in a scientific way. But it's like you, you have to really search out those therapists who really know what they're doing because you're right, it's a business. And I think some people take a concussion course and they spend 20 or 30 hours and now they're a specialist but they couldn't tell you the difference between an effort and effort pathway. So I really think you, you know, having, having an athletic therapy background, some of these allied healthcare professionals can help the researchers and bridge that gap. So then from a school system, they know where it is hard to, it is hard to determine where you're going to go. I think that communication is always being worked on. Sorry, it was a statement, not a question. I apologize. Uh, I, and honestly, osteopaths are a big part of our multidisciplinary team for exactly the reasons that you've described, for having a more global approach to well-being, which is now a, that is now emerging in all field of medical treatment. I appreciate your comment. I just didn't want to get into that because we could talk about this for like 10 hours. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.